Our next panel is hosted by the NRC, titled Technology Adoption, a Path to Process Innovation and Enhanced Productivity in Canada. I'd like to remind everyone again to please tweet hashtag CSPC 2022 and at Science Policy. We would also highly recommend for everyone to fill out the evaluation survey in the app so we can improve our conferences and events in the future. And the moderator for this session is Ian Stewart, president of NRC, and I will now hand it over to Ian. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I hope the first session went well, and it's great to see you all early after the gala. Uh, nobody woke up with big heads and decided to roll over and go back to bed, so it's good to see you here this morning. Um, our panel is, uh, as just introduced, on technology adoption, a path to process innovation and enhanced productivity. So in the wider context of a science policy, science and innovation policy context, we want to drill down into a specific aspect of innovation. And uh, that's not the eureka new idea to market aspects of innovation. That's innovation in later stages, a second generation of products, process innovation, ways in which people are increasing their competitiveness through the adoption and adaptation of technology. Uh, a friend of mine who runs a tech company said, I don't wake up in the morning and when I'm shaving, think about, I wanna innovate. Uh, what I do think about is that I wanna outcompete my competitors. And so what can I do by way of innovation and technology adoption in order to have the market position that I wanna have? Um, so uh, I had intended to uh, start this panel off uh, with Dr. Dan Bresnitz. Uh, Dan was going to come at it from a conceptual perspective. If you've read his book, uh, Innovation in Real Places, you know he has a typology and he kind of unbundles innovation and he talks about after uh, Eureka innovation in the kind of lab, he goes on to talk about the stages, uh, three other stages of innovation as he saw it, uh, which provides a nice conceptual setup for the panel. Unfortunately, uh, Dan was in an accident yesterday, and although not life-threatening injuries, uh, he has, in fact, uh, suffered some medical issues that do need attention, so he, he had to cancel out. So in that regard, uh, I phoned my, uh, my friend Dave uh, last night at 8 o'clock during the gala, and I said, you know, Dave, you'd like to be on a panel tomorrow morning uh, and talk about technology adoption innovation. And Dave, being up for most things, said, sure, no problem. So instead of having a conceptual frame, uh, um, what we'll have instead is an experiential frame. Uh, for those of you who know Dave, you know that uh, Dave was a longtime private sector uh, leader, vice president at Tundra Semiconductors, uh, startup CEO in his own right, and now has been running uh, IRAP for a long time. And as you know, IRAP deals with 11,000 companies a year, and we do support for about 3,000 companies a year, so net, net, net. Dave touches a lot of companies. So what I'm gonna start the panel off with is asking Dave about what are you hearing about technology adoption, technology adaptation and innovation for process innovation and so on. What are the kinds of considerations in that regard? So I appreciate you stepping in, Dave. Um, also, uh, in addition on the panel, you'll see here uh, Dennis Darby. I think uh, probably most people know Dennis is the CEO of the Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters Association. Uh, Dennis also has a lot of on-the-ground touch with companies across the country that are trying to improve their competitive position. And so uh, we're going to turn to Dennis and ask him about this topic from his perspective. Uh, also, we have here Ken Doyle. And Ken runs uh, the, uh, he's the executive director of Tech Access Canada, which is the network of techno technology adoption centers across the country. Uh, NSERC's a big supporter of that network, plays a very important role in that regard. So Ken's able to talk about how it is on the ground from his perspective. Uh, we have also with us uh, Assistant Deputy Minister Andrea Johnston. Uh, Andrea, of course, is a longtime member of uh, uh, ICED, uh, Innovation Science Economic Development Canada. Uh, Andrea has broad responsibilities at ICED uh, in a variety of aspects that touch this topic, but she also works on things like uh, digital adoption in particular, as well as working with companies on their innovation projects. So I've asked her to come and speak from her perspective. And then we have uh, Dr. Lakshmi Krishnan. And Lakshmi runs our Human Health and Therapeutics uh, Research Center uh, for a long time. She's now currently the Vice President of Life Sciences at the National Research Council. And she works specifically in the life sciences vertical 
on helping companies adopt, improve, and take to market their technologies and life sciences. So we have a big panel, so I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to turn to our first speaker, Dave, to kind of set us up in general from his perspective. So thanks, Ian. Um, it's very helpful, and uh, it's great to be here, uh, even if it is on short notice. Um, now, when Ian was describing we work with 11,000 companies a year, they're not all scale-ups. There are many startups in there, but today I'm going to talk about scale-ups. And so when you, you think about a company that's scaling, there are three things that they need sort of in the base taxes. They need access to talent, which is a different kind of talent than you do when you're starting out. You need access to financial capital, and again, that's slightly different. And then third, you need access to markets. And it's not the domestic market, you also need access to international markets, and you also need access to your government's procurement market as applicable. It's a very key element where uh, firms can um, both, Canada can benefit from the procurement, but also the firms can grow off of the procurement. So if we unpack some of that a little bit, and we think about, uh, in the UK, they have the Scale-Up Institute, which is an organization that spends its entire existence uh, looking at, thinking about scale-ups. Um, when we think about the talent, and there, you're, when you're a scale-up, you're big enough to have internal talent that has to learn. And, and the best way for that, that we've discovered based on the research that the Scale-Up Institute has, is peer networks. Growing and learning through peer networks. The second is you need C-suite talent, and you need have, have done that before kind of talent that you can access. And the, at the start, you usually rent it. It's a contract. And then eventually you procure it and you have it as part of your standing offer. Canada has been fantastic with its entrepreneurial growth of firms. Um, where we are now is learning how to maintain the talent and the firms long enough for them to learn how to become really big co's. And so that's a gap in Canada. And um, folks like Chris Albinson down at Communitech have been working at that. He's been twisting arms in Silicon Valley and getting people to come back, come on back to Canada, help out these companies, those kinds of things. So, and then just raw engineering, technical, sales and marketing. They need people on the ground in other jurisdictions. And so they need that kind of support on how to do that, because as you're scaling, you don't have time to figure out what the, what the rules are in France to hire somebody. Um, so that's the talent side. The capital is completely different so than as a, a raw startup. Raw startup, you get 50K. Uh, you, maybe you come to IRAP or one of the other sources of funds. You get matching funds. You've now got 100K. You can start to build your minimum viable product. You need millions of dollars in the scale-ups. and as we saw through the first phase of the pandemic, um, VC investment in Canada skyrocketed. It was very loose money, of course, uh, at that time. And now we're seeing things are tightening up and the cost to, grow, to take capital is very expensive for the firm, for the entrepreneurs and the scale-ups. Um, access to uh, new sources of capital uh, the Scale-Up Institute um, has been working in the UK with their pension funds to loosen up the rules around the pension fund's ability to invest in a venture capital way into firms in that country. We, of course, also have that rule, but we have opened that up. And then finally, um, capital to procure equipment, etc. Banks can do that. Banks currently do not really understand. If they say they do, they're mistaken. They don't understand the uh, ability of a company to grow based on the soft skills of what's in the heads of the human beings and what's on the servers, wherever the servers exist. Um, so that's capital. And then markets. Um, firms start out, they don't know how to sell. In fact, IRAP has put in a business innovation stream to help not the scale-ups, but the pre-scale-ups because they get stalled. They have a fantastic product and nobody is buying it and they don't know why. And their, re their gut reaction is, hey, I'm going to do a new product or another product or so, you know, instead of selling what you have and getting your cash flow up. Um, we've had fantastic results in the pilot phase here 
We've done about five or six of them. And the minimum growth in sales was 30%. In some of the cases, it's 100, 200% growth in the revenue of the firm just on what they had because they changed their sales and marketing processes. So scale-ups need the ability to sell, so domestically. Um, they need to understand how to uh, get onto the procurement flow in government procurement, and whether it's federal, provincial, municipal in Canada, and also in other countries, if their product is exclusively for that. And then finally, they have to go international and they have to get support on how to build their sales funnel and their results in other jurisdictions. And I'm going to stop there because I think I've covered my, I went around my wheel. You did great given you had 12 hours and you probably slept a bit. Um, so well done, thank you very much. So, so Dennis, uh, you're kind of coming from the same space. You do a lot of walking around, you do a lot of dealing with companies, you have a lot of on the ground contact with your members and uh, you guys invest a lot of time and effort in this exact spot for mature companies or at scaling up companies, trying to help them move ahead. What, what are some of the things you're observing from your membership and from the market about the challenges for technology adoption and adaptation in support of more innovative companies? Well, well thank you. Thank you, Ian. And uh, I'm really pleased to be here uh, on behalf of, uh, behalf of uh, you know, a large private sector group. And let me, let me sort of back up a little bit because I'm a little bit further down the life cycle than, than, we, than our previous speaker. Um, just to give some context, so the, the, the manufacturing sector represents about $200 billion a year, and it's about, about two-thirds of what we trade with the U.S. And, you know, and there's about, about 1.7 million people that work in the, in the sector. And, and why that's important uh, is because since the pandemic, we've really not recovered completely in terms of, you know, our output pre-pandemic. In uh, nominal dollars we have, but in real dollars we haven't. And they've been held back by two things. Uh, obviously, uh, we, I think people, we will hear everywhere, nagging labor shortages and supply chain issues. But mostly, it's the labor shortages. And why? Because we've polled our members regularly and manufacturers have told us they've turned down about $13 billion worth of business in the last year alone because they can't find the people they need. It's not just unskilled labor, it's skilled labor, engineers, salespeople, everybody, they can't, and that's the real problem. Because what we've observed over the years is that for many years, our sector, manufacturing in Canada, manufacturers and exporters have substituted labor for capital. Uh, you know, we served a white hot US market, a really strong global market. And so despite our lagging productivity on average, despite our low capital investment relative to our G7 and OECD peers and our competitors, um, we really have been able to get away with just cranking more people into the, into the factories, into the manufacturing, and really not investing. And here's one telling statistic. In the last 20 years, the G7 average of manufacturing exports has increased about 5% annually. Canada's record is 0.2%. We have barely moved ahead on average. And so that's really the context that we look at and say, what do we need to do? Because these are companies that are mature, many cases, you know, been in business for years and years. Uh, and how do we help them move that next step? And I know, I know I'll talk a bit more about that later, but really one little fact, about 97% of manufacturers are Canada. So there are about 51,000 manufacturing companies in Canada. 97% are small businesses. They're less than $50 million in sales, less than 100 employees. And they are the companies that are the least likely to be able to take advantage of figuring out how, how to innovate. And so our focus is really on that process innovation, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk a lot more about how we can help make that, you know, make that better, because it's certainly a problem that keeps us up at night. Thanks, Ian. Okay, thank you very much, Dennis. I very much appreciate it. So, Andrea, from uh, ICID perspective, uh, the long-term perspective on the state of the economy, uh, you know, uh, I said keeps teams that monitor where are we on investment in areas like Dennis was mentioning, advanced talent, machinery and equipment, and so on. We've been seeing the indicators go the wrong way for a long time. Uh, recently, uh, we saw the Hudson Index come out and point out that um, we were losing some of our um, market position in advanced industries and so on. Against this kind of tableau, which you follow very closely in your department, you've had a number of initiatives in place around trying to stimulate companies to um, 
to invest in and take advantage of and compete on the basis of technology, innovation, and so on. So uh, what's your perspective on what we can do in this space? Yeah, so we, I mean, you're right, Ian, right? It's one of these challenges, it's the innovation paradox in Canada in, in that uh, we, we tend to be either middle or in the low part of our OEC competitors. That notwithstanding, the government of Canada has some very substantive programming. Um, and Innovation Canada was created as a single window to support companies um, in, in their innovation journey rather than trying to have to navigate the multitude of programmings. It's kind of a single window and a, and a, and a warm hand, hand over from IRAP into other programming. And so we've been focused a lot under the Strategic Innovation Fund, which is our, our one of our marquee programming. Um, these are projects that are at least 10 million and above. And recently we have been doing significant investments in attracting um, what we call FDI for direct investment in uh, critical minerals and, and in uh, electrical vehicles. But even before this kind of real full court press to attract um, the world to come to Canada, we've been solidifying uh, investments. So we did uh, fusion investments. We, uh, a few years ago, we, we did uh, several investments in smart modular reactors. And so the fund is there to kind of drive the next kind of big technologies and moving forward and, and supporting not only the development, but also the adoption uh, within uh, Canada's main industries. And then that's a, generally that's typically government to business one-on-one uh, -on -one type of projects. But we've also got uh, the global innovation clusters, which were formerly known as the super clusters, and they are now in their round two of funding. And, and that is based on the model, <clears throat> we, we take you know, the Silicon Valley model or the life science model in, in Boston, that uh, you can actually adopt and um, scale faster in an ecosystem where SMEs, universities, and large companies are working together um, to, to kind of solve problems and do the technology and adoption. So a couple examples, um, in, um, in London, Ontario, there's a company called Aspire, which is the world, has created the world's largest cricket protein facility. And, Cricket protein is actually right now in high demand because anyone who has animals tends to want to feed the best food for their pets. And uh, cr crickets have the highest source of protein. But they also won an award for, from the United Nations from a sustainability perspective because they partnered with a company in Alberta called Darwin AI. And it's fully automated. There are no humans in that uh, facility. And so that shows the partnership that like strong Canadian companies can do and actually be world leading in, in the space. Another example is a company called Ideon that was supported by the digital supercluster and it's the world's first um, uh, uh, x-ray imaging. So instead of, so we've, from a critical minerals perspective, we've kind of, we, we've done a lot of drilling and we kind of know where things are, but now we have to go deeper and deeper. And so instead of doing the, the drilling quite deep into um, the, uh, now I'm going to forget the technical word, but anyways, <laughs> they have developed an, like an MRI that can go deep into the core and instead of and, and figure out where there are kind of potential uh, mineral deposits as opposed to just kind of drilling blindly. And that is a huge investment. And that, again, that's with um, Simon Fraser University, BHP, and in a startup. In uh, BC, so it just gives you a, a sense of the, the the different models that Canada has, and a, a really a kind of full court press. And then lastly, we just announced the Canadian Digital Adoption Program. And I don't know, do you want me to? I can stop now or keep going. <laughs> why, why don't you give us an infomercial on the Canadian Adoption uh, Digital Adoption Program? So everyone probably knows that um, Canada's economy is backed by small businesses. I, believe I would say 99 or 98.9% .9 of Canada's economy is driven by small and medium businesses. And like it, around the world, um, SMEs are slower to adopt. 
technologies, particularly in, in the space of digital transformation. So that could be cybersecurity, that could be your back office in terms of CRMs, in, term, in terms of in, uh, enabling operational efficiency. And what we've heard from uh, businesses is, I don't know where to go, it's, I can't, I, it's too expensive, and I don't have time. And so we, one of the streams of the Canadian Digital Adoption Program creates a digital advisor marketplace. So we have Canadian digital advisors that support companies, work with them on a plan, uh, and that we subsidize that cost of the digital advisor plan. Then when they have the plan, they know what they need to do. We move them over to BDC, and there's an online platform, and they can get up to $100,000 zero interest loan for the implementation. And then supporting from a talent perspective, they also are, have access to subsidized work placements. So we try to, and it's all in one platform. So it's timely, there's access to resources. And um, we've also created in the digital advisor marketplace now a consistent playbook for digital advisors. And so there is more coordination and a community of practice in Canada that never existed before. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, and, uh, you know, often in the Ottawa policy community, uh, we're like a parent who shows our love with money. Uh, but of course, when you're trying to raise a child, giving them money is important when they need it, but they often need a whole bunch of other supports wrapped around them. And, and so from uh, the comments that, that you made, Dave, and then Dennis made, uh, and Andrea's getting us into it, there, there's a, a set of supports we provide around financial assistance and and, 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 and initiatives trying to encourage people to make use of technology adoption. But, but we also need sometimes to provide kind of more showing, more hands-on, uh, more using uh, kind of supports. And, and so that brings me to Ken. Uh, and and as, I, as I was mentioning earlier, Ken actually is the executive director of a network of centers that are focused across the country in this space. So I wanted to kind of give you a softball Ken, tell us a bit about what you're doing in that space and how's that helping with tech adoption and adaptation? Oh, that's great. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, so we, we've heard some incredible examples the last couple of days about uh, university research and government research. Um, I'd like to go back to go forward and uh, chat a little bit about college applied research. So there is R&D happening at colleges across the country. What a lot of people don't realize is Canada is one of the most highly educated countries on the planet due to its strong public community college system. And, uh, you know, 152 public colleges across the country, 95% of the population lives within 50 kilometers of a college campus. And uh, where the R&D piece came from was about 30, 30 years ago. Uh, those same companies that, uh, that Dennis mentioned would, the, you know, go to the colleges to hire the graduates, the two, three-year diploma students, become technicians, technologists on the shop floor. Well, those same companies would come back to the college uh, because they had some sort of issue on the shop floor. They couldn't handle in-house and ask, you know, okay, you've got the equipment, you've got the smart people, could you help us resolve this? And yeah, no problem, able to do that. They'd go back, implement it, see some results, and then they'd see an opportunity for uh, maybe some sort of novel product or process or service that they could take and run with because other companies in their uh, industry had the same sort of problems. So they'd go back to the college and be like, hey, could you help us with this idea we have, get a prototype built, ready, maybe commercialize it, that kind of thing. And the college is like, sure, absolutely, we're here to help. Uh, good experiential learning opportunities for the students as well. And that really gave birth to college applied research, uh, basically using applied R&D to solve problems for firms that don't have in-house capa R&D capacity themselves, those 100 or less employee firms that Dennis mentioned. So today about 120 colleges have R&D offices and they work with uh, thousands of companies every year. There's one federal program to support college applied research and it has a mix of initiatives. Sometimes they're one and done project specific grants. Otherwise there's uh, capacity building multi-year initiatives to help a college build R&D capacity in an area of importance and work doing you know, multiple projects with companies to get that capacity up. And then for the very best of the best in Canadian college applied research, there's a technology access center designation. And uh, that, that's what I'd like to talk a little bit more about today, where a technology access center or TAC is a model for a college-based R&D center that focuses on all their areas of innovation expertise on the industrial sector of importance to their region with about an hour's drive of the center. And they're affiliated exclusively with colleges and SEGEPs across the country. 
They're set up as a public good and their mandate is to provide access to the highly specialized equipment they have and facilities, as well as the smart people that know how to use it to help small Canadian companies without in-house R&D capacity address their business innovation challenges. And their activities are designed to be complementary to the incredible work going on at the universities, the government labs, institutes, really in that TRL 4 to 8 space. Now, the, the name is Technology Access Centre, but it could just as easily be Technology Adoption Centre, Technology Application Centre, Technology Assistance Centre. Uh, and there's two main elements to that TAC model. And one is to assist the companies in their journey of commercialising a new product or service, get it to market, hanging on store shelves. Or two, assisting companies adopting new emerging enabling technologies to make them more productive and innovative on the shop floor. So there's 60 technology access centers across the country from coast to coast to coast, to Victoria to PEI to Inuvik in the Northwest Territories, all operating the same model. They work with about 5,000 companies a year, partners and clients, and 81% of those companies are small and medium-sized companies. So just a couple of examples to make it a bit more tangible. Um, Quebec, beautiful lakes, beautiful waterways, beautiful pristine area, and they wanna keep it that way. So they've been cracking down on uh, gas engines on lakes noise pollution, oil, gas, that kind of thing. So uh, a, a boat works company came to our center in St. Jerome and said, look, uh, we're curious about electrifying a water skiing boat. Would that be possible? So the center collaborated with that company, worked on it, took an off the shelf electric powertrain, retrofitted into a water skiing boat um, over some iterations, ended up having more torque uh, than a traditional water skiing boat, more range than a full tank of gas, and you're able to charge it overnight with the regular electric infrastructure at the dock. So the, the TAC handed off that uh, know-how to the company, and now it's an option for people who want to get a water skiing boat and stay in compliance with some of those rules in Quebec. Another one switching gears completely. Uh, I mean, we all know how important honeybees are to the food pyramid, the agriculture part of Canada. Um, when you know a beekeeper, a commercial beekeeper, shuts down their hive for the winter, uh, say in December, don't open it up again till the spring. If the queen dies, the hive dies, and that's bad. So a beekeeper approached one of our centers in Alberta and said, hey, is there a way that uh, I could monitor whether the queen's alive or not during the winter? And so sure enough, they used some nanotechnology and developed a tracking bracelet to put on the queen bee so that the beekeeper can go out in January with an iPad. Yep, she's still alive, move on to the next hive, yep. And if not, sadly, uh, open the hive, you'll lose some of the bees, but replace it with a queen. You get a queen bee off Amazon for $60, plug in that new queen, and, and that hive will just keep rocking and rolling all the way till spring. And you know, if you're a hobby beekeeper, great, but if you have 5,000 uh, hives you know, uh, opening up and 20% of them died over the winter, that's a huge hit. So the TAC was able to help them with that and wish them well and sent them on their way. So the, the TAC model works of, of helping these small companies, solving their problem, being that trusted R&D partner. And what, what I love about the model is there's centers across the country in large urban areas, in rural and remote areas, uh, in you know, hot sectors like virtual reality, but also supporting traditional sectors like forestry, helping sectors that have a long history of investing in R&D like aerospace, but also helping sectors that may be a bit more laggard in the R&D game, like the pulp and paper industry, uh, helping them you know, step their game up and get into the, the innovation game. And it's a uniquely Canadian model, which is pretty cool. The OECD did a study about it in 2019, and there's a few distinct features to the TAC model that I'd just like to share with you to help situate it a little bit more. Um, so each of the centers has their own dedicated facilities, equipment, and professional in-house R&D team. They don't second faculty, do a project, release them back into the wild. They have corporate history there. And all of the projects are multidisciplinary team-based, attacking the company's challenge from every conceivable angle to give them the best possible result, rather than one researcher in the spotlight, sink or swim. And then all the engagements with the companies are demand-driven, solving the company's challenge. It's market pull, not innovation push. And then compared to a traditional academic research project, which may be linked to a master's or PhD thesis, two or three years, these projects tend to be four, six, eight months in duration, moving at the speed of business. And because we're affiliated with public colleges, we're able to tap into that wider college infrastructure that's usually used for education and training to augment our capacity and, and help with these projects. And then you know, whenever possible, we try to engage the students as part of those multidisciplinary teams to give them a bit of uh, you know, exposure to innovation skills, innovation literacy by solving real program or problems that Canadian companies have. And it's not just the college students on that college campus, we also welcome university students onto these teams, undergraduate, graduate, postdoc, because we're looking for the skill set 
to make our team stronger rather than academic affiliation. And then, you know, finally, I think the real sweet spot uh, is the intellectual property policy. And at all the 60 centers across the country, uh, same thing. Uh, you know, we don't take any stake in intellectual property. The companies are best placed to commercially exploit that IP, so we hand it off to them, wish them well on their way to market, not wanting to encumber a small company trying to make it. So uh, again, I guess objectivity is key, and uh, I guess, you know, while they're affiliated with colleges, which are academic institutions, the TAC model is really more of a support for industrial R&D than academic R&D. Maybe I'll just leave it there. Well said. Um, I think your network is one of the underknown assets available to the innovation system. And Ken, it's great just to hear all that you're doing. And for people who work in universities sitting here in the audience, a lot of you are saying, well, we do that too. And it's true, you do do that too. Uh, this is a space though where we're less organized. Uh, this is a space where our programming is less investing. Uh, that's not to say, uh, I don't have a zero sum view of things myself. You know, we must be investing in exploratory research. We must be at the forefront of excellent research in this country. We need to be there. And the programming we do is vital in that regard. And people will have views. You just had a panel about the adequacy of the funding for exploratory research, et cetera. That's not my beef or my, my remit at the moment. But on this area, uh, the work that uh, all universities are doing across the country, all colleges are doing, and specifically this example here that Ken's telling us about, play a vital role in the ecosystem. I don't think we spend enough time as a policy community. That's what we are here in this room. We're a policy community. We don't think enough. We don't put enough. We don't organize enough. We don't communicate enough. It's hard to reach the companies that Dennis and Dave are working with, make them aware of these assets and connect them up. Something to think about. Anyway, I'm really, really glad, Ken, you, uh, Ken that you took us through what you're doing. Now, as the moderator, I get to ask a follow-up question to kind of uh, draw out some of the things we just heard. And then we're going to open it up. So I'd ask you guys to think about collectively um, what you'd like to put to our panel here. We're going to have lots of time for open mic. Uh, so before we get to that, Dave, you said something kind of, oh. <laughs> OK, I should be fired and replaced by Dave. Lakshmi, dear Lord, I'm so, so bad as a moderator. So Lakshmi. You work in a specific area. You are a subject matter expert. If you think about the range of activities that Ken just talked about, um, you have a particular area where you drill deep. Uh, you've been running the Human Health and Therapeutics Group, as I mentioned, uh, and you work with hundreds of companies a year, from basic research for companies that are oriented that way, all the way up to getting them into market. Uh, you have um, about uh, 300 uh, researchers and technicians, and you have hundreds of millions of dollars of assets focused on very advanced research in this area. Tell us a little bit about how are you working on technology adoption and adaptation? Thank you, Ian. And I can excuse Ian that he forgot because we're so close to him anyway, so it's his <laughs> research center, so he, can, he knows more about that too. So, uh, so I think in the life sciences uh, sector, that's, uh, the whole process of innovation is even more complex because the road to innovation is very long. The investment needed can be over two decades before you get something into market. And so through that journey, uh, it's often not easy for a company. Uh, Canada, I think we have you know, repeatedly heard that we punch much above our weight in terms of early discovery and in terms of what we bring forth in terms of ideas and concepts and potential solutions to very, very complex problems. But in the life sciences space, then taking the problem and actually moving it along a value chain to actually have a commercializable product is a very difficult, complex, long journey that no individual small SME can actually manage by itself. So the NRC has always played a very critical role in that space of de-risking and accelerating innovation to get them to that you know, uh, late stage TRL ready for commercialization. And so in the life sciences sector, this became very evident for us during the pandemic because uh, when you looked at vaccines and therapeutics development, it was you know, evident to everybody. We do not have capacity to manufacture 
those late stage products in our country in a way that is meaningful, in a way that is scaled up. And we were very much dependent in actually procuring a lot of those vaccines, which luckily for all of us, we were able to manage. So one of the investments that we was made by the government of Canada during the pandemic was to stand up the Biologics Manufacturing Center. And this center, which was built in our Montreal Road campus and is uh, you know, exemplar of actually building something in a public space where we have a center which has a different lens on commercialization. It has a public lens on commercialization. First of all, the center was built up in two years and we now have a publicly available center that can produce vaccines and therapeutics. Um, it has got a drug establishment license, but it's not going to be converted into a profitable you know, big pharma model. This is going to be a public center available for companies, available for Canadian innovation to make that last leap to commercialization. So what does that mean? This means that in the future, we are going to be able to have a space to respond to pandemics and health emergencies with government intervention in areas where we immediately need to pivot, right? The second is we are going to be able to develop and grow the domestic biomanufacturing capacity. Because now mostly in the biologic sector, what happens is that uh, companies exit Canada early in the value chain because there is no place where they can go and actually manufacture the product. And manufacturing biologics products is often the process is the product. So if you can don't have a place to actually take your process and you exit the borders, you're probably never coming back. And in many cases, we wait two, three years for a biologic product to actually come back to market entry into Canada. So this type of center can actually de-risk that aspect. Uh, second is we can undertake public niche projects. Projects, for example, in niche populations, such as in rare diseases, where commercial uh, uh, life sciences companies will not invest because the journey is long, the market is small. However, this is a very important problem for our healthcare system and for our population. So these products can be now addressed in this type of a public-private partnership. And we will complement the private sector. So we can, again, take companies through the aspect of scaling their product, getting it ready, and also able to seed other public, uh, private sector investments that have happened in this place. So the Biologics Manufacturer Center fills a very important innovation gap in that late stage commercialization of life sciences, vaccines, and therapeutics. But what about all of that before that? There was still a gap because many of our companies will actually come to our, um, uh, will be looking for a place to actually de-risk their early lead molecule. And that sometimes there's value engineering to be done, sometimes there's process development to be done. And even taking that first step of these molecules into the first clinical trial can be a very expensive proposition. And there are not many places where actually these companies can go. So for example, we did an evaluation in 2017 and we realized that there are actually over 200 therapeutic molecules and vaccines and biologics being developed in Canada, but really those have nowhere to go. And this number has actually um, spiraled since the pandemic. And in a recent um, a scan we did, it looks like there are over 400 pipeline molecules that are coming out of all of the early stage innovation being done in our universities, the excellent research that we are seeding, but these have no places to go. So that's where, again, some of our research expertise and the second uh, facilities that we are putting in, in terms of clinical trial manufacturing comes into place, where we will be able to now not only provide the expertise, process development, and all of that that's needed to GRIS can take this to the first kind of a proof of concept clinical trial for these uh, uh, small and medium enterprises, sometimes early stage start startups, so that they are set up for better success as they progress to the value chain. So to sum up, in this life sciences space, what we can do is to make sure that we bring experts together in order to work with the company, in order to actually, uh, in partnership, move them along. Second, we offer them facilities, access to uh, equipment, access to publicly funded institutions that will allow them to, in a way, in a cost-effective manner, be competitive as they scale up, and lastly, to ensure that they have places to go, whether they are scale up. So it's really an ecosystem that we can build. And this is, I think, really uh, amplified in the life sciences sector because of the very long journey to innovation and much needed in terms of how we approach this. 
Thank you very much for that, Lakshmi. I'm just truly embarrassed, so please excuse me. Now, I'm going to come back to you uh, with a question uh, about the pandemic. I'm kind of curious, how did the pandemic stress or what did it shine a light on around technology adoption and adaptation and working with clients? The thing about the pandemic and trying to provide new tools, vaccines and therapies in real time was that everything that didn't work became very apparent very quickly. You do a lot of work with uh, PHAC, with Health Canada, with ISED. You're part of that community of ADMs leading us during the pandemic period. Uh, I want to maybe, if you could reflect a little bit, what did we learn that was particularly not working well uh, during the pandemic period for helping companies adopt technology? Sure. Uh, I think the pandemic, as you said, Ian, really demonstrated uh, what in our system is uh, uh, the silos in our system and the inability of our companies to quickly access all of that what is needed in order to move forward and leap forward. Uh, I think there were silos in terms of our expertise, there were silos in terms of the uh, funding mechanisms and tools that they could access in order to move forward, and how do we bring that all together. Uh, and but. At the same time, the pandemic also demonstrated that when there's a crisis, we are very good in coming together and we are able to put aside our differences and work together and move it forward. So in areas, for example, I remember uh, that early in the pandemic, uh, it was very evident public health agency uh, realized that Canada just has maybe a weak um, supply available of uh, diagnostic buffers to, in order to continue to do testing for COVID-19. This was a crisis because we would not even have been able to know if we are, uh, what is the rate of transmission of COVID-19. And immediately we were able to, through this uh, table of all of our ICED and NRC and FAC, discuss the problem, um, Health Canada, discuss the problem, identify how we do it. And immediately uh, FAC uh, um, contacted the company which made the diagnostic buffer and they had a supply chain issue. They were not able to make it quickly enough. And they said, we would actually give this recipe to a government entity because we know that this way our recipe will be protected. We would not give it away to a private entity. So then having received the recipe, we were able to go down to NRC experts and say, can we make buffer? So we pivoted a pilot scale lab in order to make these buffers. And within weeks, we had enough buffer for you know, millions of kits. 50, 55,000 liters of buffers were made and shipped across the country. So this is, I think, a great example of how in our ecosystem we have the capacity, but I think in, in the case of the pandemic, we came together in a crisis, but we could do this more effectively even before the crisis. Another example is the decontamination of the masks. It was the same thing. We brought the engineers together. We brought uh, the uh, technology specialists together. We brought the distribution specialists together. IRAP funded the companies, and then we were able to move forward and leap forward very quickly. So the industrial solutions program was another example where we actually posed these problems to the company, and the company stepped forward, and we supported them, and then we moved forward. But I think what the pandemic has taught us is that we cannot wait for a crisis to organize ourselves, and that we need to be organized much ahead of that. Thank you so much. This uh, technical expertise, facilities, capacity in universities, colleges, government labs across the country are a resource. How are we leveraging that resource? Are we doing enough to connect companies up with leveraging that resource is a theme maybe to think about. Now, so uh, to kind of go with the first round of questions back to our panel before you guys start uh, opening up the floor here. Um, Dave, you said something kind of provocative. You talked about the United Kingdom and their startup work and how they're working with their pension funds to try and unlock more capital. I don't know if we have any members of the Department of Finance here or financial institutions, but tell me a bit more about what the UK model is and is that something here in Canada we should be thinking about? So, so thanks for that. And just before we go there to sort of riff off of Lakshmi, uh, one of the investments that was made through the pandemic, which will be coming to a store shelf near you very soon, is an N95 transparent compostable mask. So that's, they're, they're going through the, it's probably another six to 12 months, but they're going through all of the final testing and making sure that it's truly compostable and it does all of its things that it's supposed to do. Um, so in Canada and the UK, um, Probably five years ago, Canada did open up for pension funds the ability to invest in venture capital structures. 
the UK is not at this point. And the folks who are working at Scale Up Institute are sitting and chatting with, uh, is it the Chancellor of the Exchequer? So the folks, whoever the Treasury person is in the UK. And, and he's, they are having dialogue and dialogue with the big uh, public pension funds in the UK. And it's a similar situation in Canada. It's hard. It's so much easier if I just, you know, can I just not back a dam in Bolivia? Wouldn't that just be better? Because um, I know I'm going to get my money back. If I, if I start working with VC funding, I don't know how to do that. It's difficult, et cetera. Um, and so the, the structure that's needed is for, from a policy perspective, there needs to be partnership put in place. So um, not saying that the federal government should de-risk any of the investment that the pension funds put in, but they should set up a structure whereby they can leverage the talented VC organizations, especially the ones that are on third and fourth generation funds, um, because they've learned how to make money. You don't get to your fourth fund if you haven't been able to make money as a VC. And so, we, and we have those funds now in Canada. In the UK, the conversation is continuing. I expect that um, they're gonna win the day that they're gonna open it up and they're gonna make it available. And then again, it'll be a, probably a five-year journey for the UK to figure out how to deploy this, uh, the funds into this kind of opportunity and then how to make money out of it. Thank you very much for that. Um, so, uh, Dennis, um, one of the key things you raised in your conversation in your remarks was talent, access to talent, supply of talent. Uh, in our audience, we have a lot of people who come from the higher education R&D community that, and therefore the higher education community. Uh, you kind of, why, why are we having supply problems or are we? What can the public education system be doing to better support talent? How can we better connect up companies with talent? What do we need to be doing in that space from your perspective? What's CME saying about that? Oh well, that's a that's a uh, that's a big question. Thank you, Ian. Um, uh, first of all, so the access to talent. I mean, you know, we, I think I mentioned it earlier. We're, you know, we're going through a, a generational shift, and you all know that a generational shift as the the baby boom, my generation retires, and we have not brought in enough people to take over. But what's really important is that the kinds of skills we need in the manufacturing sector. Listening to all of my colleagues along here, it's all about how you adopt new technologies, how you innovate. And it's not, for, for those of you out there, it's not, you know, this, these are not the unicorns. These are not, you know, the startups. We're, Canada is great at getting the people together and the funds together to start something. The very boring work that our members do across the country is the day-to-day -day production and trying to sell, compete in the US, trying to compete with Europe, trying to compete with Asia. And for them, it's really process innovation. You know, the stuff that tax do are great is the process innovation, it's the, it's the incremental uh, product innovation. So we need to get more, more engineers, more scientists, uh, more, more logistics people to figure out how do we do a better job of making that next, taking that next level. You know, immigration is one part we've talked about that. Ian, immigration is, is incredibly important. Getting more young people to go into STEM and convince them that going into the, into the industry you know, is a, is a good thing, and these are great, productive, incredibly technically challenging roles. And that's what we, we need to do, because what I've learned is that companies who are out there right now making money don't have those people on staff. They don't know what they don't know. They don't know what technologies to look at. Um, every time we've done a program with the government, with, with ICED or NRC IRAP, where we bring people together, it's incredible how much they learn. Oh my God, I didn't know that you were doing that. I didn't know you were doing that. We've had thousands of people go through some of these programs in the past uh, that really helped. We call you know the, a consortia or a, a net or a, I guess I would call a community of practice. Canada is not great at creating those communities of practice within industry. We just don't seem to do a good job of bringing people together, and that's a role that government can play. I agree. Every one of these great, the big projects. Uh, and, and all the great programs are incredible, but it's it's those thousands of companies that where we need your help who are in the supply chain. They're the suppliers of the part of the part of the piece of the adhesive, you know, or something like that, right? So they're down in the in the, the weeds, and they don't tend to they don't tend to look up very often, and so they don't tend to attract 
as many people, the right people, and they need that help. We need to find ways to get those companies together in, and I think it, it could make a, a really big difference. Like uh, Lakshmi said, we, it, during a pandemic, we all did it. You know, a whole bunch of companies that had no idea how to make masks or gowns or sanitizer learned how in a hurry. And what did they do? They did what we never do in Canada. They started talking to their competitors and to the people in their town. I had a company in one of, in, in, I won't name it, in Peterborough, who basically was toiling away on a, a PPE, and they didn't even know that there was a company a couple kilometers away that was working on a particular material that would help them. And because we don't create that. So there is a role for us. It's not about, I, I, I know when I come to these things, I say, oh my God, you're thinking just people just want money. No, they want, they don't want money, they the money, but they want to spend the money in ways that help create these connections. Yes, there's a huge ro room to, for, you know, for, to de-risk some capital, especially for these small companies, but we need to find a way to get the people in, get them talking to each other uh, and, and really make sure that this, you know, this, we're sustainable in the long run, because I, you know, I, I personally worry uh, I love all the great examples, but I personally worry that we're not setting ourselves up for future success and getting the right community of people, of experts, is pretty critical. Well, that comment, I think, is uh, brilliant. Like, um, um, I think that we have a lot of programming and activity in the field, uh, but we don't have a lot of connective tissue and communities of practice inside the private sector connecting them up with each other and with the service providers, many of whom are sitting in this room. But this is a problem, actually, Andrea, you think a lot about. Uh, in your role running Innovation Canada, uh, one of the raison d'etre for that is uh, to try and take kind of a holistic view and try and encourage um, more organization kind of across at least federal supports. Um, and uh, through things like the super clusters, you've been trying to encourage connectivity vertically. So maybe tell us a bit about how you see this topic. Like what more should, what's the next generation of initiatives and programs to better create these collective uh, networks uh, from your perspective, given the, the, the activities you've already been doing in this space? Well, I mean, I think the, the examples you gave are, you know, they're, they're right across Canada. Every single day, people are not, where companies, universities are not making connections. And so um, one of the, the clusters, Scale AI, has developed a, a program. At some point, AI is gonna be plug and play. Um, and uh, so what about having graduates from the business schools actually understand AI as a business tactic and as and, and kind of when you're ready to kind of go into the world and, and work in, in, in um, companies, understand the role that AI can play. So they've embedded uh, AI in the course curriculum in, in many of uh, Canada's uh, MBA schools. And that's just kind of another way of kind of enabling more collaborations. But the other, we talked about the Strategic Innovation Fund, which is you know, large, very, very large dollars. But we also put conditions in, in every project that requires X number of STEM students that they have to hire, X number of R&D collaborations with universities. And so, you know, step by step, that kind of enables a kind of a stronger uh, approach. But really, Ian, that, that the, the raison d'etre for having super clusters is to have that um, dense ecosystem so that all the connect, the players in the ecosystem are connected. The challenge is it's um, people don't uh, know that they can get connected. They, um, companies don't know that they're actually a digital company in addition to a manufacturing company because you know what, they said that's very clearly at the economic strategy tables, every company is a digital company, you just don't know it. And that's because it's a tactic that everyone needs to use. And so it's it's this it's the Canada's large and from a geographic perspective, but we're not that large from a community and ecosystem. And so it's continuing to kind of invest in those ecosystems. So we the government kind of decided there are five based on our, our kind of regional um, uh, geography, the blue economy. AI and logistics, advanced manufacturing, plant protein in the prairies, and digital, and just kind of reinf reinforcing it. And it, it's a long game, not a short game. That's very helpful. 
uh, so I think, um, again, in this kind of zone, uh, from your perspective, Ken, uh, you are a service provider. You've got a service offering in the field. Tell us a bit about connectivity issues. Um, do, does federal programming steer people into you, or what's working effectively for you and trying to make sure you're connecting companies to the capacity available? No, I, I mean, um, we, we, we couldn't be more proud of our longstanding relationship with National Research Council and the Industrial Research Assistance Program um, because the, it, they understood the utility of having this network of technology access centers all operating a common model um, across the country and merit-based competitive peer-reviewed centers where there's a, a level of quality that they can trust their clients with. So uh, for, for many years now, we've been running a program called the Interactive Visits Program. And it's a, an initial engagement between a, a small company with a business innovation challenge and one of our 60 centers, whether it's to you know, refine a prototype, validate a technology. In a lot of cases, it's to get objective advice and unfortunately have to explain to them why their innovation isn't going to be commercially feasible, technologically viable, or it's in violation of somebody else's IP. So they should probably stop and pivot before they get into trouble. And that, that's worked phenomenally well. Uh, and we're talking an engagement in the neighborhood of three, four, five thousand dollars. The company put skin in the game because uh, not every company is ready to jump into a full blown hundred thousand dollar R and D project. So we we've, we've seen this to be tremendously successful. And what I'm uh, beyond proud about is that uh, you know, last year we were able to open up the eligibility criteria of that program to um, encourage the participation of companies led by members of underrepresented groups who traditionally been left on the sidelines of innovation because their you know, product was too niche, the company was too new, too small, whatever, uh, due to you know, the, the increasingly restrictive eligibility criteria of other federal R&D support programs. So with the Interactive Visits Program, we've been able to um, you know, open that up, bring people off the sidelines into the innovation game. We've seen some incredible stuff happen. And based on that, you know, getting more people into the game, we, we've sort of, you know, the tax have a, a unique mandate and role they play in the innovation ecosystem. Uh, we've almost inherited a bit of a third mandate now where we see ourselves almost like, um, yeah, you look at professional sports like the NHL, the NBA, uh, they have scouts that are out in every corner of the country, every barn, every field, every gym, looking for the next great one. And uh, I mean, we have professional R&D teams, our centers have been around for years and years. We've worked with thousands of companies. We see potential and we know when someone's got it, so we almost feel like we've become the talent scouts for IRAP and that when we identify one of those companies who, you know, they know we exist, but may not know IRAP or other programs exist, we can make a warm referral to the IRAP team and their incredible network of ITAs across the country to really open up the potential of that company to all the different supports that IRAP's able to offer. And uh, it's a role we're proud to play because it, it, it's shaped for our members the concept of a mutual client where both IRAP exists and we exist to serve SMEs, maximize their potential and create wealth for Canada. So it's been a, an awesome journey, but uh, we're trying to get more people into the pipeline. I'm going to just interview you for a second, just on behind, behind that, because one of the things that worked has worked in the past and we have, it's always worth looking at is, as you said, um, we called it these technology assessment programs. We did it, there's one called a SMART program that was done with FedDev and on Ontario for years, about 1,600 companies went through a technology assessment because what we've learned is, as you know, companies don't know what they don't know and they're not all ready to take on new technology. And in fact, it's uh, one of the parts, the worst part of my job was when we do a technology assessment and we have to say to the company, you guys are just not ready. You know, you've got, a, you've got so, many, so much work you have to do to lean out your process before you can actually start thinking about automation. We don't, we had had programs to do that. That's one of the ways that really the governments can help and the funding agencies can help is helping us do those assessments and helping companies get through it. Because if you're a small company, you're never gonna do it on your own. You're never gonna pay someone 10 or $15,000 to assess your process, unless someone, you, you know, you have someone to help you. So I think there's a huge opportunity. And what we end up doing is connecting them to TAC because that's, the, that's one of the, it's one of the potential steps that comes out of that is wow. You actually are ready, and here's somebody that can help you. So, just something to think about. It's it's all complimentary. We just have to we just have to be more deliberate. That that is a great example. And uh, you know, in this conversation, there's other players that we're not talking about today, uh, just for matters of time. And it's a pretty broad panel with six of us. Um, but you have uh, things like the relationship with the regional development agencies, where they are doing pilots, like the top your topic raising there, which is the assessments and so on. Um, maybe final last question for me before I open it up uh, to everybody here in the room. Uh, for you, Lakshmi, 
Um, for this capacity that you have, right now through the biotechnology strategy, uh, there's a lot of work underway to get uh, the university systems to create hubs and to create kind of structure around organizing them, building up the community. Um, what's going to be your relationship with the hubs? How does the BMC and CTMF and your capacity um, get leveraged? Are you, are you part of a national connectivity or, or, or how is that going to work? No, th thank you for the question. I think the investment in the hubs uh, uh, is going to be a very, uh, you know, effective way in, uh, in in which to get our university community to start thinking technology and technology uh, readiness levels and how to advance it. And so I think these hubs are going to have an ecosystem and a diverse portfolio of expertise that they're going to assemble. And Right in the concept of the hubs, we are already talking from the NRC perspective with the hubs to see where do we partner. And what I envisage is it's something like when the supercluster programs were uh, initiated, uh, then we were able to put together some you know supercluster support programs so that it's not this you know we're all kind of have the moonshot, but what can each one of us bring in that value chain and how can we all move forward together? I think this is where the hubs will also uh, benefit. And here we have an additional opportunity to actually leverage maybe some equip equipments and facilities, in investment in facilities. NRC is going to be investing in facilities. Hubs are going to be investing in facilities. Why do we replicate? Why don't we do it effectively together? So that would, I think, be a critical aspect of what we can look. Similarly, in technologies, uh, we want to uh, bring our complementary expertise together so that we have all the parts of the technology. An example is, uh, if you again, going back to the pandemic example, uh, the Pfizer vaccine that we are all very fortunate to have received and was one of the you know, blockbusters that has saved, that came from a Canadian innovation. That formulation technology was built by a Canadian uh, research, Canadian R&D, a Canadian company. However, that piece went away. But if we actually now think for, forward and actually imagine, can we keep all of those pieces together by actually in these hubs, in the ecosystem of government intramural research, in the ecosystem of other college research, talent development, pipeline, bring everything in a collective around some grand challenge programs, I think it will really help for us to be more effective into the future. So I think the hubs uh, are going to be a very interesting way in which we will coast to coast be able to build that community of practice that we have been identifying as a gap in our innovation ecosystem. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so all of you sitting at your round tables, uh, many of you are actually experts in your own right in the topic of research, innovation, technology adoption. Many of you work with companies as service providers or are from companies. Uh, you've got a panel. The panel's giving you a sense of kind of what they're doing. Uh, what kind of questions uh, come to mind? Do you think that we're well set up for technology adoption, adaptation focus in Canada? Are we paying enough attention? Are we well organized? Are we leveraging the assets we have? Welcome your questions and views. Maybe I'll turn to the mic on the left and then the mic on the right. Shannon Bard from the University of British Columbia. So I work directly with um, university professors, postdocs, graduate students, undergraduates to um, take their research, translate it, and commercialize it, and try to accelerate doing that in different ways. So we, I want to pull together a few threads that everyone on the panel has discussed and bring that back to sort of university spin-offs. So we hear of continual sort of storylines that repeat again and again and again, that um, uh, when our spin-offs go out to get investment, uh, they have a lot of challenges getting traction both from investors and from customers in Canada. Then they get better traction abroad, but the first question is asked is, how come you couldn't get your first customer in Canada? How come you couldn't get your first investor in Canada? So a, a few things to put this into context. So software as a service companies, their success rate is less than, significantly less than 1%. Deep science companies have a 20% success rate. So we actually have a you know, really good bets that we can make on these deep science and engineering companies coming out of universities. So some of the areas that I think that we might be able to focus on is our larger universities actually play the role of a municipality. So if we can leverage some of these campus of as a living lab programs, but actually have a pilot to procurement policy where we can have frameworks to allow our startup companies to do their pilots on campus, have a smooth transition to actually getting procurement. There's many blocks in that system right now. That would at least get them a first customer. 
And the second piece is how can we incentivize investment in Canada? Would there be a possibility of having um, an angel fund for early stage? A lot of the government investment has been uh, placing bets on teams that are going to be successful in any case, but we need to make bigger bets earlier on. We, if we want to have a different outcome for reaching targets around uh, climate solutions, we need to do things differently. We need to, we need, we, if we want to have something different at the end, we have to change things now. So I was wondering if the panel uh, had other suggestions on what we could be doing differently. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, Shannon. Uh, any reactions from the panel? Andrea? So, fantastic comment, and... Um, uh, but, well, municipalities, federal government, provincial governments as procurement is, is an incredibly important. And, and I believe the example that my colleague gave on the transparent N95 mask was, was from an innovation procurement program. And then the government of Canada purchases, I think, about $22 billion of goods and services a year. We need to kind of drive more of the Canadian government's ability to invest in Canadian companies. And so we have a program called Innovative Solutions where we launch challenges as well as test prototypes. And government can test them, but also we have um, part third parties. So that could be municipalities as well. And I should explore more on the university side as well that can test these prototypes. And uh, we've also developed working with a um, PSPC, a pathway to commercialization. So if that prototype is successful, we now have a way where that can get commercialized. And so Canada is the first customer. And as you say, that opens doors worldwide in terms of having that certificate that Canada is the first uh, customer. And again, totally agree with your comment. We've, we've uh, I would say Canada has doubled down in the venture capital space, like BDC is some of the recent announcements is very, very significant and uh, will have a, 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 a great impact for the Canadian ecosystem. But there's a supply and demand, right? So if we don't have enough angel investors, where is that Canadian venture capital going to find those companies? And we wouldn't want that to be outside of Canada. So I think an excellent point. So to go, to go with that, um, the, it's true the companies that have deep tech, um, if they exit or when they exit, their value is much higher. So that's true. Uh, two, um, researchers at all levels are researchers and can become entrepreneurs or maybe entrepreneurs, but not necessarily. And there needs to be a, a duo. So you need the entrepreneur and the research working together. Sometimes it's the same human being and sometimes not. And there's also uh, very interesting um, uh, spin out philosophies that are working. So there's lab to market, there's creative destruction lab, there's a whole variety of ways that the uh, institutions, the research institutions of all sorts, are bringing companies forward. To, to my mind, it is not a lack of capital, it is framing the situation for the folks who want to create the company and helping them to move through all the stages. That, if we can put that in place through all of these pieces, we will get lots of companies that grow because the, the firm needs to know what it needs to know at the time and it doesn't have to worry about later if someone has their back. ITAs do that on a, you know, 8,000, 10,000 companies a year, which is just a sliver and we do not do that very much with the university folks. And the university folks have uh, various um, um, innovation accelerators that can do that. And looking at that function and making sure that it is um, honed and refined and that you have the people with the skill sets needed for every company, I think we'll see a lot of success. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you very much. So next question. Thank you all so much for your perspectives today. I'm Sami Khan, Assistant Professor at Simon Fraser University. Um, so 3D printing has tremendously advanced over the last 15 years. So, so going beyond metals and polymers, now you, know, you can 3D print clothes. Uh, you can also make your birthday cake if you want. Uh, so um, uh, th there was an article in the Forbes last year that 3D printing can be seen as a way to alleviate the supply chain issues 
both for industry as well as um, the citizens and society. And um, when I was in the US, I had the opportunity to visit these citizen fab labs where uh, there are spaces where any uh, everyday citizens, they can send uh, their 3D printing requests and then pick it up there. So I was wondering if I could ask the panel for your perspectives on, you know, what are the challenges and opportunities for Canada to have these uh, citizen fab labs where, uh, you know, where anyone can go and print and, um, and innovate in these facilities? Thank you. Citizen-based labs, you know, it, it brings to mind things like Emerald Labs in the life sciences space, uh, not exactly citizen-based, but the idea of cloud-based labs as a new model, a new platform for making available to the research community access to high-end suites of equipment uh, in a given area. Um, I don't know if anybody's here on the panel familiar with the Citizen lab, Labs Initiative in the U.S. in that space. I, I, we're, we were called, remember, the Canada Makes program here in, that was partially funded by the government, which was actually similar to that, what allowed companies to come together and use 3D printers in early days to test out prototypes. I think we, CME ran that for a number of years. I know we, we don't run it anymore, but a similar idea, which is a, a common place for businesses to come together to prototype. So, you know, th those do exist, but we haven't, to, to this date, we haven't really capitalized on it, best I can tell. Uh, the only one I know of is actually uh, City of Ottawa Library for plastic printing you can take your design and have it printed. But that's the only one that I know of. I mean, conceptually, the idea behind tax is an analog version of that. Like the digital online version of that is, I think, upon us. Carnegie, uh, Carnegie Mellon, for instance, is also creating a cloud-based lab. Uh, we ourselves at the NRC are looking at uh, our Mississauga campus, uh, which uses AI and robotics for new materials development. And we're asking ourselves, how do we open that up? How do we kind of move into that space? But I feel that hasn't really hit us as a community, but then I might not know as much as Ken, so Ken, over to you. Well, you know, and, and you're absolutely right. It's a fascinating technology, so much potential, a lot of risks as well. I mean, you could you could load up Amazon Prime right now and have a resin 3D printer on your doorstep tomorrow for $330. Um, and that's great. I mean, across our network, we have a, a food 3D printer, Foodini. We can 3D print metal, 3D print wood. Uh, the center up at Selkirk College in Trail, BC, has a 3D printer that can print seven feet by six feet by 23 feet. So you could effectively print an F-150 if you wanted to add enough filament. Um, and, and that's all well and good. So the, you know, the, the price has come down so much, it's become so accessible. I'm sure someday that uh, you know, kids will go to birthday parties and just give a USB stick uh, instead of a gift, and it just prints at the table while they're, I don't know, I don't know what kids do, bowl or whatever, sing karaoke. Anyways, uh, the point being, it's all well and good to have access to these technologies, um, but what's priceless is having somebody who knows how to use it. So we've seen that a lot in our space where companies, um, I guess so, sort of what we do is squash techno lust where a company will go to a trade show, fall in love with a, a 3D metal printer or a robot welder, and say, yeah, we need that. It arrives on a pallet, and they don't know what the hell to do with it, right? So we're able to help them introduce that into their workflow, take an off-the-shelf piece of equipment, a novel piece of equipment, but integrate it into their workflow to generate an ROI. So it's the, the human piece, the expertise piece, that is just as important as these new emerging enabling technologies. Excellent. Well said. Uh, hopefully it answers the question close enough. <laughs> it wasn't quite, a, we're not quite right there where you are talking about in the U.S. We have a question over here. Uh, Jim McClellan from uh, Queen's University down at Nishpandi Queen's Innovation Center and visiting professor at Simon Fraser. Um, just a quick comment to the last question. Um, we've got a makerspace embedded in our uh, innovation center, which is community facing as well as uh, university community facing. And so then what we do is have sort of student mentors you know, typically from, say, mechanical engineering or electrical engineering and so forth, then actually help with things like 3D printing or Arduinos and, and that kind of thing. So that's actually proved to be uh, quite effective. Um, but, you know, the degree of engagement is, is still growing. Um, I mean, it was written a fascinating panel, so thank you very much. And, and reflecting both from an entrepreneurship standpoint, but I think also intrapreneurially, if you actually said day in the life of, you know, a technology that, moves over or gets adopted, I think sometimes it's tempting to sort of think in terms of the object itself. And, and I think you know, the comments a couple of minutes ago about companies know what they know kind of thing. Um, in the, the MyTax SFU eye to eye program, um, it's, it's really three focuses. It's, it's scientist, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial scientist, and then champion of innovation. 
uh, recognizing that not everybody's going to necessarily make a startup. Um, but if you, like, are we doing enough to develop the innate capacity both in the receptor company as well as the people that are coming up with the ideas? And in particular, the worry that I would have is also that the relationship that we have in how technology gets mobilized can be sort of shorter term transactional. So in other words, if I'm a company and I'm trying to make a decision about whether or not to head off in this new direction with say a deeper technology, which inherently probably has more risk, you know, and, and I think a lot of the things you've talked about have, have addressed, you know, can we help to sort of de-risk or define that risk in advance? But I think the piece that follows on with that is that, you know, there's wonderful programs also like My Tax Accelerate internships and things which provide an opportunity to then embed or help transfer that. But are we, is there more that we could be doing, A, to develop that opportunity identification and assessment capacity within, especially say, smaller companies? helping them to better understand how this might actually be able to help them. And I, and I say that full of respect. I'm not trying to suggest that the people in the companies don't, but I think that especially if it's something new or in a very different area, can we then be helping to develop out programs to fill in that opportunity identification and assessment and assessment of the risk involved? And then the second piece that I'd be interested in your comments on is, could we be doing more to sort of support a medium term relationship rather than a shorter term relationship that says, here, take this complicated new technology. We'd really like you to adopt it. It came from you know, our deep, deep tech lab um, so that uh, the company can, you know, over a medium time span, develop out the in-house expertise to ensure that, or improve the, the odds that you're actually gonna drive benefit from it. Sorry, long, long answer, or long question to me. But anyway, I'd be very interested in your opinion on those pieces, thank you. Go ahead. So, so that's very interesting. I think one of the things at least we find often is that uh, when companies, SMEs, come and we start working with the technology early in the cycle, uh, they're coming because they don't have access to facilities, they don't have access to experts, and we are helping them along the way. And sometimes uh, we will add even you know, complementary assets to their technology to increase the value of the technology so that it's uh, you know, much more a viable uh, product that comes out of it. Uh, but often, you're absolutely right, we don't just do a handshake handoff and go away. We sometimes actually have a relationship with a company for, you know, over a decade through v various cycles of product, through various iterations of the product. And that trust and the relationship we build uh, has, uh, is, is really very, very important in, in terms of, you know, allowing the company to grow. So we actually have many examples where we had companies come to us when we were th there were three people in the company and they grew to 70 or 80 people before they actually totally exited off a relationship of needing us. But we have helped them along the way to go there. I think those are the type of examples uh, that we want to, you know, kind of have in every sector and have the tools and the mechanisms possible to allow that type of a long-term uh, public-private partnership uh, to support and to keep that. And uh, we often say in life sciences, it's the stickiness factor, right? The the process is complex. The 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 product prototyping is complex. So you want to make it stick, and you want to make it stick to the company. So it's not a one-off, but really a process that has to go through many cycles of value engineering. So so I, definitely that's a very important consideration. I'm getting the red card and uh, we have one person standing waiting to ask a question. Are we good for a minute? Thank you, okay. So um, maybe uh, over to you. Uh, Catherine Hayashi uh, from Triumph Innovations, which is the commercialization arm for Triumph, Canada's Particle Accelerator Center. Uh, your comments about talent are really resonating with me. We're really struggling to find uh, qualified people to fill urgent positions. Um, and one of the things that I have been thinking about is a lot of the programs that were set up before in a different context, uh, maybe we need to re-examine. So, uh, for example, the world has changed around us with COVID, uh, with China, with Russia, um, but we are still in the system of labor market impact surveys that have to be completed to hire qualified people from outside Canada, uh, credentialing where engineers, nurses, uh, other other qualified people um, don't have their credentials recognized in Canada. Is there something that we can do? I recognize that these things were set up at a different time for different reasons, which are really important at the time, but now that our priorities and urgencies are shifting, 
is there something that we can do to um, ease this process of attracting talent when Canada is now a really attractive place for some incredible people uh, to come to? That's an excellent question. The supply of really skilled international labor, uh, are we making it easy for them to come in? And, and, and uh, I don't know that any of us, um, just anecdotal experience, uh, it's exactly that. It's taking too long and we're not moving at the speed that companies need them to bring in you know, uh, bring in talent from outside of Canada or, or, or the labor market. I have companies that have gone through a labor market assessment and then because the time has passed, they have to do it again. They still need that same engineer, that same technologist that they identified two years ago. And so we, we I think there, the system might might be broken and we need, and we're not gonna solve it in this room, but it's it, it's certainly part of the reason we're having such a such a difficult time of getting the talent we need to, to do that technology adoption, to be there along the way, because the, the skills we need, you know, are, you know, are, are well, every, everyone in the world wants them as well, but we wanna make sure they wanna come here. So off of that and, your, and to your question, um, there's many ways to solve your productivity challenges. Um, we talked a lot about adoption and adaptation today, so I'm not going to go back there, but that is one way to reduce your need for talent. The other is, um, I don't think we look in all the right places inside of Canada for talent as it is. Um, we're, IRAP is launching, within our terms and conditions, a pilot program where we are going to support already arrived new Canadians who are not able to find a job in their space to help de-risk the cost with the firms. So we have a youth employment program, first job for someone who's just graduated. Well, this is first job for somebody who's arrived in Canada in their space. And we're gonna run a pilot, 10, 20 of uh, contracts, and we'll see how it goes. I think that that's one area that we can improve talent. And the second is just because someone doesn't look like me or you doesn't mean that they shouldn't be given an opportunity to work in your, your organization. And I think we're missing out in the war on talent because we're not willing to uh, move and, and bring in individuals who are a little bit different than who we are into the organizations. And that's particularly true for the smaller SMEs because it's very difficult for them to um, take that risk. And we didn't talk about risk today and we're running out of time, so maybe next year we'll do a panel on risk. Um, and then finally, uh, I agree with the, the sentiment, it does take a long time to bring people in from outside the country. Uh, great interventions. I'm so sorry we have to close ourselves down, but I appreciate that you had a question. Maybe we can talk afterwards with the appropriate panel member. Uh, just on the topic of talent supply, uh, Dennis made a really important point. Canada's competitive strategy has been talent-based um, and labor differential-based uh, for over, what, since Confederation, to be honest. Uh, right now, what's particularly acute and interesting, which I think your question is getting at, is that high-end skilled talent that we're really looking for that's not uh, necessarily competing on the basis of wage differential, but make sure we just have the adequate supply. It's a very, very key ingredient for the innovation space. I wanna thank the panel. I wanna thank you for being here. Uh, so colleagues, uh, thank you very much for bringing your ideas.